Hey you guys, Freaky Finance here. I haven't been on for a little bit, <laughs> but I've been pretty busy actually in this last couple of weeks buying a couple of stuff. I'm going to try to go back into more one idea at a time. I think that's easier to go back in the videos. Ultimately, we're just in the middle of earnings season again, so I'm going to go pretty quick today. Basically, in the risk-off world, it's leading to quite some opportunities, and I'm starting to find companies that are at one-time sales, or not sales, <laughs> one-times earnings, uh, two-times earnings, three-times EBITDA, four-times EBITDA. There's quite a, like a company in mind for every single one of these multiples. And so anyway, City Trends is an interesting one. It's up there in the best idea. The timing is going to be fun for this one, when to buy it. Go through what I'm thinking right now before I jump into City Trends more holistically. So right now, the commodities are doing very well, right? And uh, tech and riskier assets are doing fairly poorly. So what I'm trying to do is rotate. So basically, it's to cycle some of these commodity winners, whether it's in energy or pipelines or... Uh, gas or oil, and as well as some gold and some Freeport. Not to say, I think all these companies are going to do really good earnings, like Freeport just reported their earnings were actually very good, and they're already buying back a lot of their company's uh, shares with their cash flow because the commodity prices is high that they're generating quite a lot of cash flow. So they're all currently great companies, it's just that i got to manage the risk because the position size and commodity keeps increasing on me, so I'm slowly selling them. And what I'm doing is trying to find companies that are down at least 70%. <laughs> That doesn't have to, that's not the main filter. The main filter is that they have to be down quite a bit, so usually around 70%, but they also have to be high cash flow, so they're, they're really cash flow positive is <laughs> the, uh, the main thing. A company that doesn't actually have uh, debt, so the interest rates actually don't affect the company, as, uh, will affect the valuation, but it won't actually affect the business, right? I also have a slight bias to companies that are uh, inflation throw-throughs. This one isn't an inflation throw-through city trends today, but the idea basically is to sell some. So I've trimmed some positions. I haven't trimmed Advantage or Termaline yet. I've sold Olive Arc. I've trimmed some of Oceanic Gold, but I think this company is still going to kill it. Embridge, I've trimmed about half. Uh, Pay2, I've trimmed actually two-thirds of it now. Suncor, I've trimmed about half. And again, this isn't, it's really just risk management. I'm just selling down because I had a little bit too much quantity exposure, whereas the rest of the portfolio was actually selling down a bit, just leading to an opportunity to cycle. I did also sell that uh, Vermilion Energy. That's uh, mainly because of their call options. The company is still putting up crazy free cash flow. This is the main theme. The market cares more about the immediate rate of change terms than it does about the level that the stock is at when the rate of change happens. So basically, short term, the rate of change trumps whatever you think value will be, right? So if the company is going to slow down, of course, numbers, the share price is going down. It doesn't matter that it's already cheap. So it's leading to these very good long-term opportunities in my mind. And so I'm finally getting able to cycle off some of these commodities that people are now chasing, find some other opportunities. That's the backstory. I'm going to try to go fast here. And I do own City Trends, so I actually got filled uh, yesterday since the video today. And it blew right through me. <laughs> this thing went down. It's a small cap. Oh, it used to be worth a billion dollars, and now it's worth $250 million. So you're getting it about 75% off. That's the idea. Well, one of the ideas is that it's cheaper. Now, it's cheaper for a reason. We'll go through it. But it's uh, going to be fun anyway. So City Trends, what is it? So it's kind of a unique retailer. You can see it's where the stores are in the southern U.S. And they actually target lower income places in less obvious locations. So what I mean by that, maybe I'll jump to here. You can see their theme is that they're kind of more local in the neighborhood, so they're actually in a retail area, or residential area rather, instead of like a, a main road where you see all the big box retailers. They're actually right in the uh, location. And so this makes them closer, and it also has cheaper leases, right? So your um, lease cost is cheaper in these little residential areas, right? The market views them as less ideal than these big box areas that drive a lot of traffic, right? The retailer focus is generally uh, Black, Latinx, or other. Caucasian is only 16%, which is different from what we're used to seeing in a normal retailer. Um, and you can see it's for lower to moderate income households. So one of the things we'll, we'll talk about, when it, there's a few reasons why the stock is selling off, but obviously if a uh, slowdown is happening, it's going to affect the lower income people more, right? So the stock is pressuring to that. But it was also a big beneficiary uh, last year. So it's cycling these comps and it's never going to be able to beat. Well, I shouldn't say never, but it's not going to beat this year. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. <laughs> this is just this sales mix split. You can see it's actually pretty good. I thought it would be more ladies, but it's actually pretty spread out between ladies, men's, and kids. So you're going there to get something, and hopefully it's cheap, right? That's kind of the idea. 
And again, we already mentioned that the operation is located in the heart of the low, vibrant, lower income communities we serve. 80% of our store associates are African American or Latinx. It's basically, the higher in that local neighborhood. And that helps also drive in traffic because people know the people working there. It's trying to have this small feeling or small community feeling, but they actually do have about 600 stores already. 600 and something now. That is pretty interesting. Again, it is a smaller company. So, you know, this is an example that I just saw on Google Trends, right? Your little kind of strip mall in the middle of a quasi residential area, right? This is just one randomly that I checked in North Carolina. But, and then we already talked about the uh, hiring again on a very diverse basis, likely to relate with the uh, customer in mind. This is a little bit misleading because 2021, they were a huge beneficiary of COVID transfer payments. So, last year, there's a lot of stimulus and it went to the lowest income people. And this is exactly who City Trends targets, right? So this shot up their gross operating margin from, let's call it, say normally it's around three or four, well, right? And it shot up to eight. <laughs> so it pretty much doubled the profitability profile of the company. And it also shot up sales by a decent amount because it's been pretty stable in this 780, maybe they're going to hit 800 million, who knows, right? When you're selling through, you're going to have less inventory, your inventory turns faster, it means you're more efficient. So they also almost doubled the inventory turns. So these are all very hard. Now this one's over, they're actually improving this without COVID, but I don't think this is going to be realistic for 2022, right? And neither does the stock. And they are doing some more CapEx investments so that their cash flow is picked up because they're doing very well. This company actually is cash flow positive, even though it's down 75%, right? <laughs> it's actually a, a decent amount of cash flow for the current valuation of $250 million. And they do mention here, and we'll talk about this in more detail, so digging into this real estate that they own. They say they own about 50 to 70 million and basically they're in the process of unlocking this real estate and they're planning to buy back shares with it like i said if the company is only valued at 250 million and they're able to sell 70 million they have we'll go through the balance sheet in a second they have about 40 million in cash it's 110 million dollars right there so they can buy back about half the company now at the current valuation in this year now they won't they only have an ncib for 60 million now but that's still 25 percent of the company they can buy this year so this is the uncomfortable quarter that we're coming up to and that's what the stock is trying to trace in is that you're going to drop in revenue you are going to drop in margins you're going to drop in inventory turns you're going to drop in profitability <laughs> right? so the the stock is trying to react to that and now it's basically we're at that point where it's going to slingshot the other way and rate a change terms so it, it shot up too high because of um stimulus not organic actual value and now it's going to go too low and the trick is to find companies who are better off during this when they're starting to come back too low and find them and buy them and another thing to find is what did they do with the cash during that COVID year, right? And if they had less debt or no debt, like this case, um, they likely bought back quite a bit of the company during last year. And we'll go through that as well. Anyway, so historically, you guys can see this. Maybe I'll blow it up a bit, but I kind of want to see the trend here. Um, these are all historical numbers. So it's right before the big COVID beneficiary year. You can see that the... Uh, Gross profit's pretty steady. Let's just call it $250 million. So the current valuation is trading at one times gross margin, whatever. Um, SGA can actually be pretty high. But at the end of the day, their spread, let's just call it their operating income, let's just say $25 million, $31 million, so $32 million, right? It's not bad. That includes depreciation, which is about $20 million for the company. So you add that back, and your EBITDA is around uh, $50 million. Oh, yeah, right here you can see EBITDA, and EBITDA $51 million, $44 million, so in that range. Which isn't bad, right? So if I told you the company is worth $250 million, it's trading at maybe six times um, traditional EBITDA, and ultimately it's trading very cheaply on the current EBITDA, but the current EBITDA is fit, well, stimulated, I guess, the way to word it. Um, but the thing I want to point out here is the trend. So a lot of people will look at a stock chart, and they'll go back a bunch of years and say, well, this thing was normally trading around 25. It's back there now, right? We're at 27. But the thing is the company bought back 50% of the float, or 50% of shares of standing since then. And it's also bought another about 12% in the last year as well. So it's actually down to 8.6 million shares right now. So it's actually bought back 50% of the company in the last five years. Right. That's one of the reasons why the EPS is moving, even though the uh, EBITDA is fairly steady. It's basically through share buybacks. And so they're guiding to about four bucks. We'll go through that as well. But so at 27 a share, you're like, well, it's only trading at six times earnings or something. Their guidance. But... And if you look at it, trailing 12 months is even better in terms of valuation. But again, you're valuating on a number that's coming down. So let's jump into it before I go through the share price and why I'm in it. <laughs> we'll just go through. I was normally I'd do them a little bit more prettier for you guys and for me. This time I just downloaded them and just my notes and then I highlighted the 
all of them are the lines that I focus on for this company. And every company is different for me, so I always have a different, it's not like I have a template. I wish I had a template, but I have to go through them and see, okay, this is important to me for this stock at this time. So anyway, the ones that you want to look at is cash and inventory. Uh, retailers, always inventory is important. So here you have inventory creeping, uh, actually creeping in the whole industry, inventory is creeping up. That's not good for a retailer. That means they have to push inventory in the future, um, which means that the uh, margins will come down as they discount the product. During COVID, almost all the retailers were able to sell through at full margin without having a discount because if they had anything on shelves, it was selling. Um, good sales last year was doing very well, and that's for the whole industry. So we've seen inventory start to creep up again, and that's uh, ever great. It's not crazy high, but it's, uh, it's actually back to more normal levels, but it's something that I watch. That's the main thing up here. i will talk about cash in a second. And ultimately, the first check is liabilities. The biggest liability here is their operating leases. Um, they only own two properties, so the distribution centers, which are in the process of unlocking value, which is one of the reasons why I'm interested in this company more than other ones that are also down and cash flow positive. Liabilities, there's no long-term debt. There's no current debt. So traditional debt, zero, which is nice. So that's basically my <laughs> my little note here. To my, these are always notes to myself, right? So it's like uh, hard to go bankrupt without any debt, right? So is this thing going to zero? I mean, it just gone. It went from 100 to 27, right? And I bought it at 29 point something. I'm probably going to add as it goes down because I, I I never catch them. Right? I'll never I'll never be perfect, but I have over time I will make money on this, or at least that's what I think, right? That's why I'm in it. Um, anyway, and you also look at retained earnings. Just if you ever see this negative accumulated deficit, that means the company's still unprofitable. Over time, it's been unprofitable. So this company is profitable and it's been profitable over time. Um, and here, if you ever want to look at the opposite of share buyback, so when you see their share count go down, that's always a good sign. But if you ever see uh, treasury stock um, continue to increase like this. It tells you how much cash they poured into um, buying back their shares in a given year, the delta. So it tells you where the cash goes. So because if you look up here and you say, well, it had 123 million in cash, and now it's down to 49 million in cash. What the hell, right? Um, the reason why is that they've bought back a bunch of shares last year. Unfortunately, they bought them at the high prices, which <laughs> is if they would have bought, let's just call it 116 million um, in treasury stock. Um, at the current prices, right? They would buy back half the company instead of only buying back uh, 12 and a half percent of whatever they bought last year. <laughs> um, that cash flows uh, probably for retailers more important. Well, balance, the balance sheet is always the most important in my mind. So cash flow is second important. I kind of like to see how it does. So we know the current year is juiced up because of the COVID stimulus transfer payments. So we know this $82 million in EBITDA isn't realistic, right? And we, so we'll just say like the 43 and the 35 are probably more likely. Um, so I think the company's better than it was two years ago, probably, but I don't know that. So we'll just say that it's around $50 million in EBITDA. It could be 40 million. So when you look at the valuation, you're like, well, this thing is $250 million. It has 50 million in cash. This thing's only worth $200 million. Um, and it has $80 million in EBITDA. It's only two and a half times EBITDA, right? Very cheap. But the thing is, it's two and a half times the inflated EBITDA from transfer payments, right? So you try to take that out if you can. You get a more realistic, say, 50 million in EBITDA. So it's still trading at four times EBITDA, but it's not trading at two and a half times EBITDA. So anyway, um, cash flow, the main thing is, is it positive? <laughs> can the company make it through a rough patch, right? And then what does it do with cash? The main driver here is it invests quite a bit back into its um, business to revamp them up. And the remainder, so the delta between whatever the cash flow from operations is, and the purchases, or the capex really, goes into for purchase for common stock. So you can see right here, if I add those up, that's 176 million. So again, the company's only worth 250 million. They bought back 176 million of shares in the last three years. <laughs> They've actually bought back the current market cap over the last five years. Anyway, so that's what they're doing with the cash. Cash goes into revamping the current stores, and then the remainder goes to buying back the shares. And here's the current common shares outstanding. The January 29, 2022. Hopefully you guys can see that. Up back 15 or 14.6% of the company in the last year. Unfortunately, it was when the stock price was very high. So they got less bang for buck on the buybacks. And now they're finally getting more bang for buck on the buybacks, right? <laughs> the share price is down 75%. So um it's it's exciting for me, right, to see this. Um and then finally the income statement. Hopefully you guys can see this. Um again, I just exported it and then write my own little notes on it. So it's not as pretty. I like to have the zeros that kind of tells me, okay, this is millions, but whatever. <laughs> In my head, because I can remember it later. That's why I do it. So anyway, you can see the GMD shoot up. We know this 
it's called this extra hundred million and or yeah, extra hundred million in GMB is fake. <laughs> well, stimulated <laughs> is a better word. So again, you get the EBITDA around 51, 37. See the average there is 45. So we removed the ridiculous comp and we got the more average number. And, so, and that was in line with what was historically happening. And it has been slowly turning up. So you can see the profitability profile has gone up. It used to be stuck at around a buck fifty for a while. It did creep up to thirty, and now they're getting. And actually, they did hit almost seven bucks in earnings. So if you look at four times earnings now or something like that, but that's the two stop earnings. Right? And you can see again more of the same of the uh, share count going down, and that has continued to increase. Okay, metrics wise, ultimately the last year looks too good to be true because it is it's two stop. But you can see how is the EV over time. It used to be worth 280 million back then. Um, during the COVID, when the company started increasing in value significantly, share price reacted. So it actually went up to 100 bucks. So it actually did hit a billion dollars, right? <laughs> EV market cap. Again, that's the market running with something in a rate of change term positive too high, and now it's going to rate of change term negative too low. And so we get to play this. I've never seen it this drastic, but it, this is happening in a lot of stocks, and it's going to be very exciting once we actually. I kind of view it like a like a sine curve, right? I can't really see my hand come out of the screen, but like a sine curve. <laughs> and uh, it's going to shoot the shot up too high, and now it's going to shoot down too high. So it's just a mean reversion, and it will slowly get more average, assuming we don't have war, pestilence, plague, <laughs> that in the future, right? It's going to slowly become more normal. And then this fool, I think is one of the reasons is the, up <laughs> the upside of the volatility now works and the downside of the volatility is going to keep uh, mean reverting. But the kicker here, and the reason why I like this over some other stocks, is that they're unlocking cash and have actually sold one of their distribution centers, about 38 million, and the other one's going to be 32 million. So, and again, these numbers might be like, well, they're small, but you got to remember that's, <laughs> that's a large part of the market cap, and a lot of that is going to share buybacks, especially as the share price continues to go down, it's going to look more attractive, right? But anyway, they have NCIB of 30, they just expanded it to another 30, so they have NCIB of 60. And so my game plan here is likely slowly add. And this is a consensus short, so this is very exciting. And ultimately, no one big is going to touch this because it's only a $250 million stock that no one cares about, right? These are just notes to myself what the upside could be. Right. So that's the income statements and the financials really quick. Let's go back to here. So again, so this is where I got filled on yesterday. Down thing went from like 32 bucks. I was like, oh, it's under 30 and I bought it. <laughs> and then I went right down to 28. <laughs> so how was it trading before? So it was trading in this 23 range. In 2018, it was in this 30, 28 range. And this is again when the earnings power was only, let's call it, it wasn't two bucks, but we'll say it's two bucks. So 14 times earnings. It's kind of been where it's been trading around. Maybe in some years it's a 10 times earnings, right? But 10 to 14 times earnings. Um, during the COVID panic, sells off like everything. And then we get all the stimulus coming in, transfer payments, especially in March of 2021. This thing just shot up with it, like reacted like crazy, right? So the stock went from, well, let's see the before COVID, 23 bucks, down to seven on the panic. So you can see no one really buys this company. It's very, uh, no one looks at it, right? It's very sentiment driven. And then it shoots up from seven to 100. <laughs> and then it goes from, the slowdown, we have this year, 94 bucks, all the way down to 28. So we're almost back to where, well, we are back to 2018 levels. So I'm looking to add more in this 20 level if it gets there for me. That's an even better margin of safety. And who knows, the, like last time they kicked it down to seven, right? Maybe that's a ridiculous valuation, right? If it's <laughs> another 75% down, right? The company would be trading less than cash and less than the buildings that it just sold. So anyway, that's the idea is to slowly add as this continues its decline down. And so I'm going to keep looking at it because I know this quarter is going to be horrible. This quarter is probably going to be horrible because they have these hard comps here that the share price is trying to react to. But I think it's going to overshoot it the other way. And that's why I'm starting a position here. It's kind of fun. Again, this is just another way to see the absorber. So they over-earned. This is another way to show over-earning. <laughs> you can see everything look good and that's too good to be true. That's because of the transfer payments that I talked about. Here's the buildings and here's their capital return program. So during the last year that just ended, they bought back 1.37 million shares. Remember, that's a fair amount because they only have 8.6 million left. So they're buying back quite a bit of the company. Um, fortunately, they spent $115 million last year to buy them because the share price was so high. <laughs> right, if you had that cash now, they'd be able to buy back almost half the company in one year. So they still had 30 million available and they just increased it to another 30 million. The board of directors today authorized another 30 million. Anyway, for the buildings, Basically, they're saying Darlington, 45 million. Other one, 35 million. 
I mean, you see that it's 80 million, but I'm assuming that they're actually only going to get about 70 million because all the little transaction people get paid along the way. <laughs> and who knows, right? It's a decent amount of chain or chunk change, but it is a, an extra catalyst for me from a margin safety standpoint because as these things get sold, they're going to have the extra cash to buy back the shares when the shares are depressed. And that's what I'm looking forward to is to buy along with them. So this, I kind of do like, what what does the screen say? So this is kind of like a, there's just like a check to see, okay, what's going on? So the company's super cheap. It's not going to be as cheap in the future. So we know we already knew that. That's what these two lines say to me. What else? I mean, we already know most of the ratios are cheap. So I'd be like, not the company. We went to the financials. So this really didn't tell me much. Though we do know that it's uh, stimulated. These are all going to get worse, right? And that's why you see here, this is what gets me really funny is that is the short float. So <laughs> usually I had to take a double like, is this true? 40, 41% of the float is short? Because remember, there's only like, here, you can see like 8 million shares outstanding that are actually float. And uh, so that, that's that's a big amount of shares that are short the company, right? So here's here's the little calculator that's, I don't know if you have short, shortsqueeze.com. It's a pretty good one. You can just type in a symbol and see. And you can see that, yeah, this is a crowded short. It's going to take them six and a half days to get out if it ever moved against them. That's how much of the volume they own. And another thing I look at is the rate of change is increasing. So that, are the shorts getting more aggressive after it's already come down 70%? And it, and that's what's happening. So they're getting more comfortable shorting it. Like it's going to go to zero or something. And I can just vision this guy, like a hedge fund. And like, oh yeah, this company, look at the stores, right? And can you get inventory on the shelves? $250 million valuations going to zero. Retailer after COVID, it benefited too much. It has all these comps that it's never going to comp, which is true, but they're all thinking the same thing and they all go into the same thing. And so this is going to be very funny when it reverses. I don't know when it's going to reverse. So that's the fun. So that this gets me really excited because I can just picture this guy who makes more in a year than some employee here makes an entire lifetime, right? Um, so I'm kind of sad, but uh, that's what I when, I, when I see something like this, I'm like, wow. <laughs> right? Ugh. Anyway, um, again, this is the guidance. So they're still opening stores, which I'm not a fan of. But they, they are still reiterating their guidance that they're planning to grow as of fiscal 23. That's the caveat here. So 2022 is going to be a crap year. Right? So they're expecting to at least grow 20% a year. They did guide, but fully diluted just for four bucks in earnings power. Take the low, cuts a big range. <laughs> so four bucks in power versus seven. So, well, it looks like it's cheap at uh, 28 bucks. So four times earnings. Realistically, it's. When you normalize for it, you're getting a little bit higher, six or seven times earnings. Still dirt cheap, but it's dirt cheap because the rate of change is so negative. And that's really what they care about, right? And is, is, did this company over-earn during COVID? Yes or no? If yes, then short it, right? That's the uh, thinking. So anyway, and you can see here, first quarter decrease of 25 to 30%. So that's one of the reasons why this thing has gotten taken to the cleaners. It's like, oh my God, you're losing 25% of your business year over year, right? And now we know from this slide right here, it tells, pretty much tells the story. Yeah, because they had this ridiculous amount of transfer payments in Q1 last year that they're about to report against coming up. So I'm interested to see how this quarter reacts. Like, does it smack it again? It's already guided to the 25 to 30% decline. It's already guided to almost half their earnings going away, earnings per share. But how does it, does it kick it down farther? So this is going to be very fun for me because if it, it does, and then they also reduce guidance again. Say they cut the earnings from four bucks to three bucks, right? More traditional. And that could be even more exciting because those shares are going to get even cheaper and then their buybacks are going to be worth even more because this company is cash flow positive, right? Like I said, it's not just that they have 50 million in cash or 49 million in cash or the 70 million that they're unlocking through the distribution centers. It's the fact that they also generate about 10 million in cash flow a quarter. Well, cash, 10 million in even a quarter is another way to word it. They're getting a decent amount of uh, cash inflow at all times. And so that's going to slowly, slowly eat away at the share account like it already has over the past uh, five years. Pre pretty cheap, but I mean, when when the rate of change is so negative, you have this huge guidance down 25 to 30%, it can get really cheap. Like the, like I said in my one comment at the beginning, it's the, the rate of change always beats whatever you think the actual value of the company is, right? In the short run. And then longer term, it will matter so as the cash flow continues to come in, right? Assuming it comes in, which it should based on historical averages, right? That's why I like to see is the company actually profitable over time here. And you can see that the EBITDA, yeah, you're getting about that 10 million a quarter, right? Anyway, I'd like to know your thoughts on City Trends. It's probably a little longer video, but I always have so much information to try to share and <laughs> go through because I listen to these after. Like when the thing goes down, see if it goes down from 27 bucks and tomorrow it goes down another 10%, another 10%, right? 
and it goes down to 13 bucks a share. I want to look at my video, re listen to myself, think, and say, Am I right or wrong? Should I buy it a lot more or not? Right? That's kind of the idea. But yeah, anyway, have a good rest of your week.